Good day. My name is Michelle Lavander, and I'm the director of the USC Center for Health Journalism. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, Dying for Care in America's Nursing Homes. Today, we'll hear from Letitia Stein, the newly appointed health and science editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Until recently, she was an investigative reporter for USA Today, where she led an in-depth and remarkable investigation of COVID deaths in America's nursing homes, a project at the heart of our conversation. Her reporting has sparked a call for a congressional investigation and for a review by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Her reporting for that series was undertaken while she was a fellow in the 2021 National Fellowship one of our flagship programs here at the USC Center for Health Journalism. It's a fitting moment to discuss the Dying for Care series as the US has just marked the 1 million COVID-19 deaths um, number. Older Americans make up a huge and disproportionate sh share of that stunning figure and seniors in nursing homes were especially vulnerable. An estimated 71,000 nursing home residents died in the winter surge of 2021 alone. But these tragic deaths weren't inevitable, as Letitia's reporting demonstrates. Trilogy, a nursing home chain based in the Midwest, stood out for its high death rates. The problems of understaffing, lax infection control, and a profits over people ethos is not limited to this one for-profit publicly traded nursing home chain. In this webinar, you hear ideas for how to take a closer look and how well nursing homes in your community have been doing when it comes to protecting residents during the pandemic. We'll also touch on President Biden's plan to address these persistent problems. Our guide today, Letitia Stein, is a veteran health journalist whose work has spurred congressional reforms and exposed excessive hospital billing practices. Previously, she investigated failures of the healthcare system at USA Today, wrote about US news and politics as a Reuters national correspondent, and covered the health and education beats at the Tampa Bay Times. This webinar is made possible thanks to the generous support of the Commonwealth Fund, the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation, the California Endowment, and individual supporters like you. You could tweet about this webinar with the hashtag nursing homes, and we will be archiving this conversation later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. A word about our format today, we'll be hearing from our speaker first, and then we'll turn it over to our audience for questions. Feel free to share general comments in the chat. Because we have many people joining us on Zoom, we'll ask you to write your questions for our speaker into the Q&A panel. You can write us there if you're experiencing technical problems as well. Now, let's get underway. Letitia, what got you started on this very impressive project? What questions did you feel were going unanswered even as we saw one headline after another on the terrible death toll of the pandemic in nursing homes. Um, well, thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you for um, both in inviting me to be here today and also for uh, the support that was offered by the fellowship, which was really tremendous for this project. Um, I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment. Um, here we go. Um, so I can just show you a little bit of this project as we talk about it um, in a broad overview, and then um, and then we can talk a little bit more generally. Um, so where this all started is early, I guess, last year now, um, early 2021, I went to my editors um, with this idea that would ultimately lead us to find a nursing home chain, which stood out for its um, high death rate. They reported death rates that were twice the national average at the height of the pandemic. Um, it also had a unique investment model in what we would learn was the cutthroat of care. Um, I wanted to know then, uh, did all nursing homes fare equally once COVID got into their communities? Was it possible that there were some that had worked homes? And could we follow the money in an industry that's known for really complex finances that make profits very difficult to see? So from the first, uh, really the first start of the pandemic, when we all started realizing the problem in nursing homes and started getting immediate attention, I just thought that this story was all the elements for the best investigative work, right? There's robust data available, public records, um, and a vulnerable population that sadly suffered badly, um, in this case, through deaths uh, during the pandemic. So the numbers alone really were a driver for us. Um, in the winter of 2020 through 2021, um, we saw the 
this sort of surge of deaths in nursing homes um, nationally. And just to kind of bring us back to that time, uh, which, you know, of course, I think we felt maybe the pandemic was going to end coming out of this. Um, this is after we knew how bad nursing homes were going to be hit by COVID. We had some knowledge on how to protect and guard against COVID, although we did not yet have the vaccines widely available. We had adequate PPE. Um, you know, there were things that, you know, ostensibly could have been done so that these numbers didn't have to be so high. Um, and yet they, they still were. Um, the total numbers, which I think you mentioned, are 71,000 people died in nursing homes nationally during this winter surge uh, period. Totally through the end of 2021, we had 140,000 deaths in nursing homes in the United States. This is, you know, more than the military casualties of pretty much all of our major wars um, combined. And no one had been held accountable. Um, so there were some, some challenges that um, we're going to need to solve with this project and coming at it, you know, at the end of 2020 into early 2021, we had a better understanding of what some of these reporting, um, reporting challenges were going to be. So pretty much every media outlet had been writing a lot about outbreaks in nursing homes, but generally we were looking at it, you know, sort of in an episodic way, right? In a really bad outbreak that, you know, somehow came to attention in an individual community. Um, no one had really been able to look uh, across the entire country and answer this question of whether or not some places fared better um, or worse than others. Um, there were some reasons also, you know, in the academic research that were kind of clouding the picture, right? We, we knew by now we had dozens of academic studies that once COVID was out in the community and circulating, that level of community spread was really closely correlated to what was going to happen inside a nursing home. And this talking point, and, you know, in some ways it could could be used as an excuse, you know, it kind of clouded this question of, well, what was actually happening at individual facility levels? Even less was known about, you know, the chain ownership impact, right? Like, was it possible that there was a systemic issue involving, you know, a single, uh, a single chain um, or perhaps a single type of a business model? Um, much of this is not even very well tracked by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which regulates nursing homes nationally. Um, so we designed a data set or a data analysis to try to answer some of this question. We can talk more about that um, in a bit. But while this work was underway, I also asked that basic reporting question of, you know, can we follow the money, right? Nursing homes um, are, are known for, you know, completely opaque finances. They provide a lot of information to the federal government, but it still is very difficult to know um, if they are making money, particularly at the, um, the corporate uh, chain level. And so I've seen this reference um, in, in a like a somewhat minor reference to uh, something called a, re a real estate investment trust that was involved in nursing homes. Um, there are many REITs involved in many nursing homes as we would learn. Um, and I was just curious, you know, what is this? And what is this doing in a nursing home? And I learned that REITs are also publicly traded companies, which means they have to file with the SEC, which means you get some insight into their finances and particularly their corporate level profitability that isn't available through the type of information that government, um, the government collects at the facility level from nursing homes. So all of that was really sort of the impetus for, um, for where we were going. And I honestly could not have predicted when we began this reporting that these two lines of reporting were gonna intersect when our data work identified one Midwestern chain, Trilogy Health Services, whose high death rates could not be fully explained by factors like its location or the resident age or the health status. Um, and then I was able to learn from the SEC reports that as COVID surged, millions in federal money were flowing um, you know, to the REIT based in California that owned this nursing home chain. Um, and from there, we were able to dig more deeply into what was happening through inspection reports and interviews and all of our, um, all of our, our kind of standard reporting methods. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen and come back to you then. Thank you so much. I just realized I was muted. Sorry about that. Um, and Leticia, your reporting also had a kind of a personal element to it as well. And, and um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you learned from your father's battle with illness. Yeah, um, thank you. I, uh, I, I came to appreciate the value of nursing homes, not because I actually had a direct experience inside of one, but um, but saw the need for them. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we are a rapidly aging nation. I believe the 80 plus population or demographic is the fastest growing in this country. Um, my father was 84 at the beginning of the pandemic. 
And at that phase of life where, you know, you visit a doctor three to four times a week for little things. And when the shutdown came up, you know, those little things are considered electives and small minor ailments quickly snowballed. And he um, went from being able to essentially be at home with, um, you know, a relatively small amount of assistance to a hospitalization at the height of the shutdown, um, after which he was completely bed bound. Um, and at that point in time, we didn't have access to a nursing home that would be a high quality nursing home. So he was sent home um, for sort of, you know, the final stages of life. Um, he was dropped off in a stretcher in the living room. Um, I was sitting there with a home health aide who was on her first day of the job. Um, there was a feeding tube that was given to us in a box and that was that. Um, and for the next roughly three months, you know, I was involved in coordinating what would normally be a nursing home level of care. Um, it was excruciating. It was incredibly difficult. And that was with the resources and the wherewithal to be able to do that um, in our home. And again, um, you know, I, I really came to see that nursing homes are essential infrastructure um, in our society. Uh, where this aging demographic is going to, it already is affecting so many and it will further uh, be affecting so many people in, in the business world. As I um, came to learn, they describe the demand for nursing home services. Um, they link it to something called the silver tsunami, right? The aging of our, of our country. Um, but, you know, without one, um, you know, it's an incredibly difficult situation. And, and with them, you know, we, we trust these facilities, these are our most vulnerable people in many cases, medically vulnerable. Um, it's not too much to expect that they're going to be getting safe, um, adequate care. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that personal note um, on this investigation. I, I wanted to turn to some of the details of, of just the remarkable scope of what you undertook. And, and data played a really crucial role in helping you to focus your story on this one nursing home chain trilogy so what kind of data do you turn to? And broadly, how did those data points sharpen your reporting focus? And if you could also just mention some of the ways that you kind of accounted for potential um, things that might moderate understanding, things like what was going on the, in, in the communities where the nursing homes were based, some of the ways that you adjusted the data that you had. Yeah, um, well, for starters, um, you know, I had a tremendous uh, data uh, team and partnership and colleague um, with my coworkers, um, Jamie Frazier and uh, Jeff Kelly Lowenstein, um, which I was very fortunate to. But you know, in the broadest sense, I think when people talk about using data and reporting, I sometimes have heard, um, heard it referred to as like you ask data questions. Um, I might go so far as to say that um, it's more like interrogating data, right? Like you need to, the, the sheer existence of a lot of numbers isn't gonna, isn't gonna yield the story, right? So in the case of nursing homes, you know, I think we ultimately were linking together, you know, maybe a dozen different data sets, very robust data with, you know, there are 15,000 nursing homes roughly in the United States. So information about COVID, cases, deaths, finances, um, staffing, um, there, there was a ton of information, um, but really what's crucial is how do you use it, right? What, what are you going to do with it? And I think that um, what was sort of the starting point for us that, um, you know, we ended up looking at things in almost every way imaginable, but, um, but as a starting point, uh, we knew, as I mentioned, we knew that we had to deal with this question of community spread. Can you control for what's happening within the community and still understand whether or not a nursing home was, um, you know, was, was up to par. And um, that was a question that I, we really hadn't seen answered in any of the academic research. There wasn't a clear model there to go off of. Um, but the federal government had created a system. Um, it was a system that was used to award billions of dollars of bonus payments to nursing homes. Um, this was uh, rolled out in roughly the time period that we were looking at. And the idea was that they wanted to reward nursing homes for doing a good job of keeping COVID out. And it controlled for factors like what was the level of community spread in the community, right? And sort of said, okay, like, you know, if you're above a certain threshold, we're going to give you money. And if you're below it, we won't. And I, I looked at this thing and, you know, it was a rather complicated scientific model that I believe was originally developed by the CDC. Um, and I said, hey, what if we reverse engineer this, right? Instead of looking for the places that did better than expected, could we use this to find places that, you know, were, were worse than expected? Um, it seemed like a very simple question. I have a feeling my data colleagues would tell you it was like nothing, <laughs> nothing but. But, you know, using, um, using that kind of an approach, we were able to, to start to answer these questions. And then again, 
whenever you're working with data and it, as was the case with Trilogy, on almost every possible way that we kept looking at this, whether it was fraud, death rates, these more complicated and sophisticated statistical models, and we kind of kept going with them, they, they kept emerging as this outlier. And that's when, you know, you know that you are seeing something. And as, as far as um, I understand it, no one else has attempted to do this kind of sweeping analysis. You looked at nursing homes across the country and you, um, you also just, you know, did this kind of comparison that could lead to some pretty unique and very important insights, which leads me to ask why, why would it take a, a journalist to do this? Shouldn't our government be doing this as part of their kind of postmortem of what went wrong or researchers? Uh, how, how did it end up this way? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can uh, fully answer that, although, um, you know, I think I can say that this really speaks to the unique watchdog role that we play in the media, right, and why it's so important to have, have media. Um, you know, uh, academic research um, looked at a lot of population level pieces, but it really didn't ask that question of corporate accountability. Um, the government didn't either, particularly in this situation. Um, as we would later learn in some of our interviews with CMS, um, you know, their, um, their focus had been at the facility level and not at, at the chain level um, during the outbreaks. And really very little work had been done in academia and very little um, has been tracked by the government about real estate investment trusts um, and their role in nursing homes. You know, and I think some of it is just, you know, we as journalists, we ask these questions and we see ourselves as, um, you know, perhaps the, the watchdog for the public in a different way than, um, than other institutions do. And, and you just pointed to something that seems really quite important, that a lot of our regulatory system is built around individual nursing homes. And so these kinds of corporate connections and the idea of a, a good actor or a bad actor across the chain aren't that easily detected. Is, is that correct? Yes. Um, you know, uh, CMS, and this was among the, among the many kind of problems we ended up having to solve um, was even just figuring out who owns nursing homes, who are the big owners. Um, CMS does track uh, corporate owners of operators, although there are some problems with the data. So that's, you know, essentially the trilogy, right? The really big entity that runs the nursing home. Um, but there's very spotty tracking then of the real estate investment trust that may have purchased the land and the building around it. There's even less known then about, you know, what kind of a model, business model they are using with that nursing home, right? Our reporting ultimately found that Trilogy's ownership model was somewhat unique in that it, um, it took advantage of a 2008 law that had, to the best of, of anyone's knowledge, not been used before in a large nursing home chain, which allowed the REIT to share in the operating profits rather than, you know, kind of simply collecting rent, which is a more traditional model with a REIT. Um, similar questions are being raised around private equity um, investment in nursing homes, which, you know, is a whole other area where there's, um, you know, some academic research and a need probably certainly for more, um, more government tracking. Uh, many of these are pieces that the government is, is saying, um, you know, the Biden administration is saying that they, they, they recognize and they know they need to do more with. And tell us a little bit more about Trilogy, the nursing home chain at the heart of your investigation and some of the key findings about the lapses you found that were revealed by the data. Yeah, so Trilogy um, is a, a large operator of nursing homes that has grown, um, grown quickly. It is based in the Midwest in four states. Um, and what our data work um, showed was really by measure after measure, um, it, it stood out for poor outcomes based on its reported, um, its reported numbers, the numbers that it put into the system. Um, just to quickly back up, at the beginning of the pandemic or relatively early into the pandemic, CMS required all nursing homes across the country to be reporting on a variety of metrics, including COVID deaths and infections. Um, and you know what, what the required reporting was changed a little bit over time, but that was pretty consistent from about May of 2020 or June of 2020 on. Um, this was self-reported data. Nursing homes were su supposed to report accurately, but it did come directly from the nursing homes themselves. Um, after we um, did our, our reporting work and shared the information with Trilogy, um, as our story reflects, they said that their reporting had been incorrect and they revised their numbers. Um, even by their revised numbers, um, their rates still stood out. 
Um, however, um, they revised their numbers downward quite considerably. And, you know, so we were looking initially at the reported rates, right? Um, but, you know, again, it, it kind of any way we kept looking at it, they were standing out as an outlier um, in the states in which they operate and among large chains um, and among REITs. Um, we also then, you know, after seeing that these were the, you know, that it stood out for its COVID outcomes, we then started looking more closely at what might have been going on within Trilogy, within this chain, um, and looking at sort of a separate data set that the government has collected for many, many years on nursing home staffing. We were able to see that they had gone um, quite far uh, further than um, other major chains in shrinking some of the care that gets delivered to residents in the years leading up to the pandemic. Um, and in particular, um, where they had been making some significant cuts was in care delivered by what's known as CNAs or certified nurse assistants. These are kind of the frontline workers in nursing homes who do all of the, you know, bedside delivery care, right? They're, they're critically important, um, generally speaking, you know, not super high paid, but a, a huge part of the nursing home budget. Um, they are who feed and bathe and, you know, kind of run to the side when something is going wrong. Um, and, um, you know, there is some research, early research that suggests that, you know, their presence also was important in, um, in dealing with infections and controlling outbreaks once COVID got into nursing homes. Um, we, we further looked at inspection reports on nursing homes. So, you know, the government, the federal government, which works sort of in partnership with states, they are always supposed to be inspecting and looking in, at nursing homes to make sure that they are doing um, all the different things that they are, they are required to be doing. Um, these inspections changed during COVID and in many cases they were spotty and didn't take place. But even with what we were able to, to see and learn, we could tell that half of Trilogy's facilities um, were cited by health inspectors for violating you know, some of the different safety rules that would be relevant during COVID um, during 2020, which was that first critical year of the pandemic. And you know, when you go in and read some of these reports, which essentially gave you like a eyesight into facilities that were locked down during the shutdown, you know, we could see just these repeated lapses for things like hand washing, right? Like over and over, whenever inspectors were showing up, again, limited people, they were seeing staff not washing their hands, you know, things like AIDS, putting in eye drops and, you know, lifting patients to the toilet, et cetera, um, lack of masking. Some of these very basic steps were, were often not taking place when you had a very short staff that was very frenzied and exhausted. Um, so those were some of the pieces we were able to learn about Trilogy from the data. SEC filings, again, gave us yet another window into some of the corporate level financing um, that, you know, while um, you know, the way that the SEC filings for the REITs worked, we, we can't necessarily see Trilogy had mixed campuses where they had both assisted living and skilled nursing on the same campuses. And we can't necessarily see exactly what was what, but we do know that skilled nursing um, accounts for the majority of the business and that the business as a whole was profitable, quite profitable um, during, uh, during these critical pandemic years. And additionally, the SEC filings detail um, how, um, how they were uh, preparing for a stock offering, um, which is tentatively proposed to occur at some point this year. Um, I should say profitability is, is also complicated. All of this was somewhat complicated, but by the metric that the financial world would look to see, um, you know, kind of gauge that basic profitability, um, they, they, were, um, they were robust uh, at that point in time. And one of the things that you did in your reporting process as I recall, was construct a kind of timeline so that you're able to see that at a time when the chain is, you know, has these like fewer CNAs and some of these essential pillars of good care, they're also boasting about their financial uh, prowess to, you know, potential investors, right? I mean, you, you, you could counterpose those two things by piecing together what was happening with the, the public filings to investors uh, as a, a you know public uh, entity versus the uh, the conditions in, in in the homes. Yeah, um, I like with these uh, with reporting projects. I like to almost like take notes in a spreadsheet, um, and um, I did that um, with a lot of SEC filings. And, and I should share we didn't just look at trilogy. We looked at SEC filings and we looked at um, earnings reports for. Um, pretty much every major REIT that has a significant presence in nursing homes. Um, and that was a lot of insight into the general financial picture of how finances worked during COVID, which then when ultimately our data work led us to Trilogy, all of this kind of background and context became really important. Um, but yeah, you know, when you are 
putting these, you know, notable, um, these SEC filings are hundreds, if not thousands of pages, right? And earnings calls, you know, uh, lots of different um, transcripts and pages. So when you're kind of like pulling out the key points, throwing them in a spreadsheet and linking that to date where you can then create a timeline and then you can bring in other things like, hey, what inspection reports were telling, occurring during this time, right? What do we know about, you know, what may have been, you know, kind of being told to families during this time or promoted on social media, then you can start to weave together a picture of, um, you know, of kind of what was happening in different places and who was being told what. Um, and I think that that, that connectivity, um, you know, ends up being how you can, you know, do, you can connect dots and you can also do descriptive reporting, um, even if, you know, you had limited, um, limited access, uh, which we did. We, we asked to visit Trilogy facilities and, and we were not um, granted permission to do so. And we've talked about the data process and some of these public documents, but what we haven't yet talked about is just the incredible narrative power of this series, which is really fueled by the stories of people, whether it's a CNA feeling completely overwhelmed or grieving families. And, and you've mentioned that you really felt it was essential to keep the focus of this series on the people who lost their lives and, and tell us how you built what really became a kind of chorus of, of voices and, and the memorial wall that you built. Yeah, thank you. And I may try to share my screen again, just to show you um, show you our memorial wall. Let me um, do that if I can for just a second. So um, through, uh, through the, uh, the fellowship, the USC fellowship, um, I um, was able to participate also in what's known as an engagement grant, um, which was led by uh, Ashley Alvarado as our senior fellow. And you know, she really encouraged us to think about um, when we write any story, to be thinking in terms of the affected population and the communities um, that, that lived this, right? Um, and you know, as I mentioned before, these numbers, 140,000 dead, they're just staggering, but they almost became numbers um, at some point in the pandemic. And they weren't, they were people, they were names, right? Um, they were stories. And uh, I just, it, it resonated so deeply with me, um, even more so after I started talking to some of the people who lost loved ones, how could we, how could we honor this? How could we do this justice, both in the story itself and, um, and anything that was you know, related to it? So this memorial wall um, you know, is open to anybody who wants to share the story of anyone who lost a loved one in a nursing home, um, not, not just Trilogy. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's been an interesting um, experience and the people who've chosen to do so, these stories are lovely and we received some just incredibly meaningful notes um, from people. Um, who were telling us that um, that it really meant the world to be able to honor um, honor their loved ones, um, and then within the story itself, you know, um, I, I in trying to from the beginning, I, I knew that the names had power, right? Like traditionally in journalism, we will often look to names when we're dealing with a mass casualty event, right? But when we're actually writing stories, we um, we end up doing um, anecdotal leads, or you know, we end up focusing on one or two people. It's hard to ask people to follow a lot of different stories. Um, and, and I, you know, went back and forth about was there a way to um, to get that sense of scale in the writing? Um, it, it took, quite frankly, lots of rounds of editors telling me my lead wasn't good enough <laughs> to um, to get to where I think we we suddenly were able to figure out and realize that yes, in fact. Um, there was a way to use these names and these stories that we were able to collect working um, across the USA Today network. So some of the papers that are owned, you know, owned by the same company across the country, um, and bring and bring those stories and bring these people um, into our, our main story, um, as well as you know, kind of a traditional treatment of like a side vignette. And so just just to quickly um, you know, give you a sense of you know these people and, and their lives and how much they mattered, I pulled just a couple out. You know, we had people like Martha Miles. She was a social worker. She raised three boys. Um, she um, spoiled um, you know, twice as many grandchildren. Um, her grown son cried when I interviewed him um, to learn about the ownership model uh, behind Trilogy. He had not even heard the name. Um, people like Bill Malone, he was a community theater star. He was 65 when he died. Um, his wife never got to tell him the final I love you. Um, Ed Winholtz was 83. He was a farmer. He was a lifelong bachelor. He had eight sisters. He liked to tell dirty jokes. 
Um, Byron Eggermeyer was 87. He was an engineer and his grandchildren called him Bobby. Um, I just, to me, that's, that's what the story was really about, right? These people. Thank you. And thank you for honoring those memories. That's one of the really important things that your project does so, so very eloquently. I, I wanted to turn to, to a kind of practical note as I think about the journalists who are joining us today. And you and your colleagues did an incredibly complex data analysis. You, you um, crafted these beautiful profiles of those whose lives were lost. And there were multiple players involved, but not every reporter who wants to try and tackle something like this would have the bandwidth to do something at this level. So for a one person reporting project, how can reporters begin to track nursing homes that are outliers in their own communities, either they're doing a fabulous job or they're really troubled in the ways that, that you found and, and where would you suggest they, they start and what questions might they be able to answer really in any market? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I will share my screen again one more time here and um, and show you uh, through our data work, we put together a, um, a lookup that will allow people to look up um, any nursing home in the country, um, see how they performed um, at the height of the pandemic. And it's kind of a report card type that allows you to you know, kind of get a quick glance, but behind this information, you can also get more information um, on kind of the methodology and, and the numbers that were used. Um, my understanding is that this is now um, open to the public. Um, at one point it was um, behind the paywall, but regardless, you know, we hope you'll support journalism. But this is a great resource um, if you'd like to try to you know, see what our data was showing for nursing homes um, in your community or, or just you know, for personal use if you're curious. Um, you know, it's, um, the data analysis was, was complicated and, you know, we had some, um, some extraordinary data journalists um, leading that work for us. But, you know, I think that uh, there are lots of things that you can look at in your community relative to nursing homes that are, you know, just kind of right there. First of all, CMS has been putting out the COVID death numbers, um, COVID infection numbers, now vaccination numbers, staff and vaccination numbers, like all of this is available on CMS dashboards and it's relatively easy to use. And, you know, particularly if you're in a confined, you know, geographic area, you can look to see if there are some differences occurring between nursing homes within your community, right? Because in that case, you know, there's really no reason to think that the level of, of infection or spread is significantly different as it might have been, you know, between one part of the country or the other. We had to control for that in our analysis. But if you're just looking within your community, you would be able to just sort of, you know, take a look at those numbers. And if you see somebody that, you know, has roughly similar numbers of beds and really different outcomes, I think that's an indication, you know, hey, what's going on here, you know? Um, I also think that inspection reports are a really tremendous tool. Um, there have been a lot of problems with, you know, the, um, the frequency and the depth of inspection reports that occurred um, is it, sorry, when I say inspection reports, nursing homes are supposed to be inspected regularly. Um, so that means like somebody from the health department goes out, takes a look around, there are varying levels of inspections, they will investigate complaints, you know, um, and then they'll do a write-up if they find a violation. And those write-ups often have a lot of rich detail about what the problem was. Um, this information is publicly available or should be publicly available in a state. You can go um, onto, usually it's kind of linked off of the state health department website and you can then look up an individual facility. Um, it's also available at the federal level, but I think it's pretty easy and straightforward to find at the state level. Um, and, you know, I, I think just reading some of these reports will give you insight into things that were going on. Um, you know, it's not... Uh, so it's not completely always apples to apples because of some of the, um, the issues that were going on with inspections. But when an inspection was finding a significant violation, you know, or a significant lapse, that's a story, right? What sorts of things did you find in those inspection reports, maybe a telling detail or two that really opened up your reporting as a direction in your reporting? Yeah, um, you know, we... Um, we, we looked at uh, we looked at Trilogy had I think 115 uh, nursing homes and then you know drilling a little bit more into some places where we knew there were significant outbreaks. We found descriptions of inspectors walking into outbreaks at times. Um, CMS did tell us that you know they were monitoring these these numbers that were being reported weekly and when they saw what looked like a hotspot they might have sent an inspector out. So you know it didn't always happen, but in some cases and there was one in particular. Um, you know, Kokomo, Indiana, where, you know, the report, like, you know, showed an inspector walking into the middle of an outbreak on a memory care unit. 
Um, and, you know, there was a patient who was just wandering around, um, you know, without a mask, um, from room to room, coughing, same patient, as I recall, um, had had a fever a couple of days earlier, um, you know, sanitizer not being used or not available. Um, as I mentioned before, just repeatedly these violations of hand washing um, and hand washing in you know, almost every imaginable situation, right? Like lack of hand washing, you know, whether they were, you know, touching patients who were using the toilet or were eating um, eye drops, oxygen tubes. Um, some of the later inspection reports, so this is, you know, getting into 2021, um, you know, and this is part of what nursing home inspectors would typically look at, might also talk about like, hey, we have low staffing, right? Like we can see on these 10 days that staffing fell below what would be considered a reasonable level. And here are some of the situations that, you know, we are also seeing at this, at this facility, um, another facility that comes to mind, you know, where they, they were documenting low staffing. You know, somebody sat, I believe, um, you know, uh, un unresponded to after, um, you know, uh, you know, defecating in, in their bed for you know, an hour, if not longer, waiting for an aid to be available, people who weren't getting medications in a timely basis. Um, all of these stories, you know, doesn't give you people's names, but it gives you quite a lot of insight to what inspectors are seeing um, when they're there. And, um, you know, the other way that you can get insight, um, which, which we did, is to then try to talk to people who either worked there um, or, or spent time there. You know, nursing homes, typically family members are in and out during COVID that has not been happening. They've been shut down ostensibly to keep the facility safe, right? From, from COVID getting in. Um, but, you know, there was one instance where we were able to, um, to find an, an interview a family where um, they were granted a, um, a limited amount of access um, for a, an end of life visit. Um, you know, compassionate care was, was an allowed reason to get in. And, you know, nobody asked any questions when they just created a rotation to keep coming in for four days until, um, you know, until their loved one passed away. But, you know, that, that's quite a lot of access and eyes into what was going on, you know, in a facility um, that otherwise you know, didn't have members of the public looking at them during this time. And a quick data resource question for you. Nursing Home Compare is the kind of classic site where you could look to find a lot of data, but for this COVID specific data, is there a different database that reporters should look to? Yeah, um, CMS has a dashboard. Um, I, I can try to look it up, but um, essentially if you were to like, I can probably just Google CMS COVID dashboard. Um, CMS has been collecting their COVID statistics and keeping them, um, keeping them publicly available. I don't believe that that is also linked to off of Nursing Home Compare. Nursing Home Compare is sort of the, the long time um, the long time source for um, for information about nursing homes and it includes some inspection reports and violations it includes some basic information on the nursing home um, and um, and it will also uh, now include some basic staffing information thanks and I, I want to turn to the broader policy questions that this um, reporting really has illuminated and and your the publication of your report pretty much coincided with the Biden administration announcing a number of new policies to try to address the kinds of problems that your series illustrated so so starkly, including staffing levels. Can you give us an overview of what the Biden administration is contemplating and what questions we should ask about whether this is really working and these reforms are going into effect? Yeah, I mean, the Biden administration is a very long and lengthy proposal. Um, <laughs> so, you know, among the, the core pieces of, of what it's trying to do, and a lot of these are, are elements that have been discussed previously around nursing homes um, by the Biden administration and in Congress um, for some time, you know, looking at staffing levels and, you know, um, trying to have some um, enforcement mechanism or some um, requirements for some minimum staffing to a greater degree than, than has occurred. Um, the Biden administration is talking about wanting to get a better understanding on some of these corporate pieces um, that have, have not been well understood by the government, um, whether it's, you know, chain ownership and um, an ability to, to lack, to, to track and look for some problems across, um, across ownership entities, which might take you across state lines, um, or also just better understanding private equity um, and real estate investment trusts. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the biggest question with anything is, well, what actually gets implemented, right? Um, <laughs> nursing homes, um, we knew before the pandemic that there were a lot of problems in nursing homes in America, right? We knew that staffing was an issue. We've known this for a very long time. Um, 
we know that even when there isn't a novel virus um, that is, you know, particularly um, devastating to this population, that there are issues with infection control, um, that there are issues with safety. Um, so, you know, I think the critical question is, you know, what gets implemented? Um, what, if anything, gets enacted by Congress? Um, you know, the Biden administration can use executive authority for, for some pieces, um, but also, you know, bills have been before Congress before um, to look at some of this. The real estate investment trust issue is also an area that, you know, um, the Biden administration mentioned it, its proposal, but, you know, uh, nobody um, had really spent much time with this. Um, academic researchers that were just beginning to do um, some of the bigger work um, as I understand it, um, you know, I, I even had a difficult time finding experts just to explain to me how all this worked who weren't actually in, in the field. So I think that certainly is an area that, um, that could, could get a lot more scrutiny, um, both by the government um, and, and by the outside. Um, and, and I believe that um, there, there was a call by a congressman for that to happen um, in response to our, our work. And um, going back to the real estate investment trusts, you're, you mentioned um, to us earlier that you were sitting there reading the one book you could find <laughs> about it and trying to tap the expertise of its of its author. But where, uh, in your mind, does the business story and the healthcare story intersect um, when it comes to this growing presence of corporate ownership through these real estate investment trusts? Yeah, um, so... Um... REITs have been involved in nursing homes for um, for some time. Um, it, it, so it, it's it's a newer phenomenon, I guess, in the sense that you know we've seen it um, you know in the last maybe 20, 30 years, but it's not it's not brand new. Um, and you know um, it, it's again the reporting question is I always follow the money for a reason, right? Like you know we, we there's often an interplay in healthcare between um, care quality of care and and financing. Um, so that's why we wanted to, to ask those questions. Um, what, what we were able to learn specifically around REITs um, is the federal data that CMS maintains is particularly spotty around this information. So again, CMS collects just reams of information about nursing homes and supposedly also around their ownership. Um, but the data sets that, um, that you know, are publicly available, we were able to identify only about 500 facilities nationwide that are owned by one of the major publicly traded REITs or the REIT that, um, that owns Trilogy. Um, you know, we went through SEC filings um, and were able to identify 1,800 of these facilities, which means that about one in nine nursing homes has REIT ownership. There are different models through which that's going to occur. Um, some of it is the way that the experts would kind of commonly talk about it is it's like a landlord and a tenant, right? Like I collect rent and every you know year I have a built-in way of collecting a little bit more rent and that's gonna have long-term consequences potentially that really haven't been studied. And we're now kind of well enough into this universe that you know the rents have been going up for a while, right? Um, but, um, and then again, with Trilogy, what we were able to learn is that it was even a more unique ownership model than that, because um, this was a situation in which there, there was an allowance created through a 2008 law that would allow a healthcare REIT to actually, you know, sort of take the operating profits from the entity inside the building that it owned, and that's what's being used here. And that was very atypical for Anderson. So we're going to turn now to the questions of our audience. There's a lot of great ones um, that I can already see. If you have a question and you haven't put it in, please put it in the Q&A panel. It's a little easier to track them, but, but I'll just mention a couple that popped up in the chat. And Letitia, there's two that are very similar. So I'll read both of them because I think you might sort of keep both of them in mind in this first response. One question is from Thomas Plant who says, this is my question. What are the lessons learned from the inadequate response to COVID in nursing homes? And how are they preparing for the next potential emerging disease for seniors in nursing care? And then there's also a question from Anjana uh, Najarin Boutine, who says, thank you for your tremendous work. In times of tremendous stress like COVID, we're able to see the breaking points of any system. What are the policy changes you would advocate for to help our elderly age with dignity in a nursing home? Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's, it's uh... These are huge questions, um, and um, you know, it's uh, I, I don't know that we're in the advocacy uh, field of things, but um, I think some of the issues that are getting a lot of discussion out of COVID and, and 
really also had previously because we again knew we had problems. Staffing is critical, right? Like what is gonna happen? Um, what is required in terms of staffing? Um, not just registered nurses who, um, you know, probably that's where the, the, the requirements are the clearest. Um, and certainly registered nurses are just critically important. These are nursing homes, right? Like nursing care is expected, but also some of the staffing levels um, around AIDS um, who deliver so much essential care. Uh, patients in nursing homes, um, you know, uh, in the years leading up to COVID and probably uh, beyond are, are increasingly sick, right? I mean, this is almost like a step down from a hospital in many cases. Um, and, um, and that requires a tremendous amount of care um, so, you know, the levels of care that are being delivered um, is obviously something that needs a lot of attention. You know, infection control is an ongoing issue, and I have seen some discussion out, out of the pandemic on, you know, should facilities be designed differently? Um, you know, can you have different, um, you know, shared rooms, separate rooms? Um, you know, what can you do around sanitation? And I think this is also all kind of a critically important question. Um, but you know, I, I believe that you know we now have a new a new um, national academies report that you know looks probably hundreds of pages you know looks at these you know many many problems and makes recommendations for solutions. But you know, at its core, I think we have to decide that we care about nursing homes. We as a society, right? Like, do, what is um, what is the level of you know what is the level of resources that we need to be providing to these facilities, right? What is the level of regulation? What is the level of just minimum standards? Um, some of this is going to be, you know, state level. Some of this is going to be federal level. Um, but fundamentally, you know, it also is, you know, just addressing these broader questions in the country of, you know, ageism, right? And, and just how how we handle this, this large, looming elderly population. Yeah, thank you. And a kind of similar question from Lauren Mapp, who says. Have you tracked what impact your reporting has had at Trilogy? And if so, what has it been? Um, yeah, you know, we, we published two months ago. Um, <laughs> so um, that's actually not a super long time. Um, and, and as we, we shared, you know, we, um, we had ongoing conversations um, throughout the reporting process with both Trilogy and their REIT ownership um, and, and really sought to make sure that we were sharing with them our reporting findings um, which they then, you know, said that they had submitted some incorrect data and they have submitted correct data or what they consider to be revised data, which CMS is now um, reviewing. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit difficult. To clarify to that, that point. They, the data that you analyzed was the data that they submitted to correct. the federal government, to regulators. And then after you shared it with them, they said, oh, actually the data was wrong that we reported, right? Just to, to clarify the, the sequence there. Yeah, so um, the government required all nursing homes to report COVID data. We analyzed COVID data. This was the only uniform set of information across the, the country, which is why it was required. We analyzed it. We shared this information with them. Um, we asked them many questions. Um, and then in the course of that, um, that process, they came back and they said that they believed that they had been miscounting, um, actually mischaracterizing some of their deaths that they believed they did not actually have to be reported into the federal system. Not necessarily that people didn't get sick and die, but that they didn't have to be reported the way the federal government was, um, was collecting this information. They subsequently revised downward the numbers that they reported, self-reported uh, to the federal government significantly. Um, even we, we tried as best as we could to analyze their, um, their revised information and it still found that they, in many instances, um, had, had significant, um, significantly high rates. Um, and, uh, and also the, the federal government has said they are gonna look, take a look at these revisions because it, it really is beyond um, the scope of what other nursing homes have done with their self-reported data. Thank you. And we have a question from David Cordero Mercado who says, did you have the opportunity to observe data on um, Puerto Rico and other US territories? You know, um, I'm gonna have to um, admit a little bit of, I'm not quite sure how Puerto Rico was handled um, in the data set, but I, I can show that we didn't do any significant um, data analysis outside of the, the primary United States or the, the, main, the mainland, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
let's see here. I'm just going to go to the Q and A panel because I've gone through the uh, <laughs> the chat questions. Uh, Karen Buffard asks, "Thanks uh, for sharing your excellent work. How many reporters are on your team, and what were their various roles?" Yeah, we had a great team. Um, it was also a collaboration, which is always um, really nice when we can do that in, in a newsroom um, between, in this case, um, the investigative reporting side and the data investigative reporting side. Um, so our core reporting team was, um, uh, again, kind of fluctuated a little bit over time, but there were four of us. Um, we had um, two uh, special two data reporters who specialized in data, but you know also did you know, wide ranging reporting work, and then um, you know myself and another reporter who um, you know are more of the uh, the boot leather reporters. Um, we have a question from Anita Roghaven who says a lot of nursing homes are operated by entities that are different from the owners. It sounds like this was the case with Trilogy. How hard was it to show the profit imperatives imposed by the REIT led directly to the cost cutting trilogy? And are nursing homes required to report their financial solvency to the federal government? And where can that data be found? Yeah, so, and, and I should say, I mean, um, you know, cause and effect is always very difficult to, you know, we are, um, we often, um, you know, don't, don't necessarily uh, be, have an ability to say, you know, completely because of A, B happened, right? But um, things that we are able to do and that we can look at is, you know, okay, what is the general trend here? Where does an entity stand out? Um, in the case of Trilogy, they stood out both by their reported uh, COVID outcomes, which were poor, and also by some of the, um, the, the costs um, and reductions in staffing that occurred, and then also by their ownership model, which was unique. Um, but, you know, um, information on nursing home finances and ownership, it's tracked in different places via the federal government. In particular, there's a form um, through CMS known as the cost reports, where individual facility level nursing homes are required to, um, to share a lot of information about um, costs, expenses, you know, what they're paying uh, staff, things like that. Um, the challenge with this is that um, these are sort of facility level reports. And, um, you know, it's almost like, um, it's almost like a very intricate web nursing home ownership, right, where you have, you know, this is your nursing home facility, and then, you know, it's owned by like an LLC, and then another LLC is kind of above that, and still three more LLCs, all owned by the same company are providing the therapy services and the cleaning services and, you know, um, some other ancillary care, maybe the farming ser pharmacy services. And so after all of these different entities, you know, kind of report out, um, you know, the, the facility reports how much it pays these different entities, perhaps it'll tell the federal government and, you know, we weren't profitable last year. But what you can't tell from that is, was the person behind or the entity behind all these, you know, kind of interrelated companies, was it profitable? Um, and that's a question that is, you know, honestly a, a tremendous issue and has been an ongoing issue for many years of trying to understand nursing home finances. What was, um, you know, interesting around um, REIT ownership is that there is some corporate level reporting on these broader profitability metrics. And again, I should say, I'm using the word profitability. Um, there actually are some very specific margins that get reported. Um, these are pretty complicated financial documents, um, but, you know, by the ways in which the financial world is able to kind of assess, you know, is a core business doing well or doing poorly, we were able to get a sense of that through some of the REIT documents um, in a way that isn't, um, isn't available um, always or isn't clear from the way the federal government collects the information. We have a related question from Abby Watson who asks, um, can you talk more about ways to find out who owns these different nursing homes and assisted living facilities it's difficult to see who truly owns them. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, it, it is. Um, you know, again, uh, there is some information available through CMS that looks at the chain ownership. So, for example, a very large nursing home chain, you know, through some of the different um, data sets available through CMS, you, know, you might be able to say, you know, hey, these 100 facilities are owned by the same chain. Um, sometimes that information is incomplete. Um, you also, um, and, and that information is often particularly incomplete around the REIT ownership. Um, so there isn't a really good answer. We um, essentially try to compile our own lists. Um, this is a lot of the work that, um, that my, my data colleague, Jamie, uh, did and took some time and how to compile the list and fill in the holes um, involved a mix of, you know, 
looking at um, looking at uh, SEC filings where REITs will report their individual facilities often, um, looking at um, you know the, the federal data, but then also just looking at you know company websites, right, and pulling together lists, um, and then comparing it with publicly reported information to, to make sure that it looks to be accurate. Um, it was it was a an onerous task to try to get at this question of corporate ownership, um, and you know we were primarily looking at the large chains too. There are the nursing home industry is like multiple industries, right? There's large corporate chain ownership. There's nonprofit ownership, which sometimes can also be, you know, a large kind of you know, chain type entity, although it's a nonprofit. Um, and then there are, you know, kind of mid-level um, nursing home uh, companies that maybe operate, you know, a couple dozen um, facilities. And then there are mom and pops. There are a lot of different types of business models in this. I would say that, you know, if you are, you know, looking at facilities of interest, probably the best thing to do is start with their website. Um, then, you know, see what you can learn from the CMS website. Um, and, you know, also it's not a bad idea to try to look up like property um, property records. But at one point I was trying to add up how many LLCs I saw referenced in some of these financial and corporate documents. And I mean, it's, it is uh, an incredibly convoluted world. Thank you. We have a question from Jean Dorio who says, how can we utilize personal stories from medical professionals such as MDs, RNs, LVNs, and CNAs, family members and ombudsmen to reveal the true scope of care in nursing homes? I suppose in many ways, that's part of what you did. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, um, it's almost like, especially during COVID, because, you know, these facilities were shut, they were locked down, there weren't the usual um, you know, eyes and ears. And so it's almost like when you're hearing stories from each of these types of individuals that you're mentioning, you know, each is like a glance or a window into what was occurring. And then if you can try to stitch it together, I think that begins to give you a 360 degree look that, that we didn't have. We have more of a comment here from Marga Pares Arroyo from El Nuevo Dia newspaper in Puerto Rico. She says, I'd like to know your findings about the staffing problem in nursing homes during the pandemic. Here in Puerto Rico, there was a great turnover of employees on these facilities. Some quit because of the risk of getting infected or because they got a, a economic stimulus package related to the pandemic. Meanwhile, other employees got infected and were on absent leave for several weeks. And this placed a great burden on the owners of these facilities because they couldn't keep up with the daily operations alone or with few employees and that some nursing homes had to close which caused a big waiting list on the ones that continued operating. Yeah, you know, nursing home staffing is, um, it's, a, it's a really complex issue on a lot of different levels. Um, so it's an industry um, in which, you know, you have a couple different levels of people who typically work in a nursing home. You have your registered nurses, and then um, you have a, you know, the CNAs, the, um, the bedside aides, and then you have sort of a, another form of a nursing aid known as an LPN, which I believe is a licensed practical nurse, but I'd have to look that up to double check. Um, and each of these individuals in a nursing home have critical roles to play. Um, the CNAs who provide kind of the most bedside um, attentive uh, care being kind of the bulk of the workforce. And it's a very low paid workforce typically. So, you know, during COVID we had a lot of different pieces of things going on. Certainly we had, um, you know, uh, issues around people getting sick or perhaps feeling that they, they couldn't work out of their own well-being and their family's well-being, and that might have led people to, to quit. I think you also had a huge amount of burnout. Um, you know, there also were shortages of, of staffing that have been quite well covered. I, I think that, you know, one of the things that's worth keeping in mind because, um, you know, the, the nursing home industry talks a lot about the staffing challenges that it has, and one of the arguments that has been made to some of the you know, increased staffing that the Biden administration is, is calling for is that will it be too expensive? We can't afford it. And where would we find these people anyway? You can't you can't staff nursing homes adequately. Um, and, and that's an interesting question. Um, and, and that is certainly, um, you know, that is certainly a viewpoint that, that a lot of concern has been raised by. I know some of the academic experts also say, you know, look, you solve these problems by paying people better for these jobs, right? Like, you know, if you were to pay adequately for um, for these jobs, you will have a workforce. And if you were to take care of your workforce, you will have less burnout issues. 
Um, so I think there's a ton that can be written um, around around these issues, um, and um, and it's it's a multi-dimensional issue, and I think it should be probably explored from all the different all the different angles rather than allowing you know only one side to to kind of dominate the story. And I just want to point out that Jamie Fraser, who is uh, Leticia's partner in crime on this project, has posted a lot of really useful links in the chat as well as an, a really interesting comment about this idea of the differences between uh, looking at different kind of owners and their size. And there's been some reporting on for-profit and nonprofit, but she, she talks about some of those nuances. So just encourage you to take a look at the chat if you haven't already. We've officially run out of time, but if you if you have a moment or two, Leticia, we'll, we'll just kind of go through final uh, two questions here. One is from Michelle Gray, who says, what do you think is the most important policy area of focus moving forward? Oh, you know, what do I think um, <laughs> versus what someone else might think? I, I don't know. I mean, I um, I think obviously staffing is a, it's the huge issue that um, you know, even before the Biden administration specifically started talking about, you know, it's latest round of reform packages, they were talking about, you know, staffing, um, you know, Again, these are nursing homes. You go there for the level of care or nursing that is delivered there. Um, that said, I feel like you know these financial questions um, are, are really critical, and that it, it's it ought to be something that you know regulators could wrap their heads around if they um, you know if we had the right kind of policy measures in place to do so. Um, you know, in, in healthcare, um, we we often see that. Um, you know, financial incentives are either aligned or misaligned in ways that have really big impacts on the care that people receive or how people are tested for different um, diseases and ailments, how you access care. Um, you know, typically it's, it's not so much about a decision of, you know, it's often a decision about, you know, how the provider is being reimbursed rather than a decision about, you know, what is completely the right standard of care for the patient. Um, and so, you know, given that we really, you know, continue to have this um, opaqueness around nursing home finance in terms of what the government um, knows about it, at the same time that we're seeing, you know, significant Wall Street investment in nursing homes, which, you know, some of the experts that I spoke to said, you know, where Wall Street goes, there is money. I think this is a question that ought to be knowable. Um, and, you know, that is also part of some of the reforms that have been proposed. Let's, let's get some transparency around these finances. And the final question is from Heidi Lenahan, who says, can you provide any insight in the patient payer mix for the Trilogy nursing homes? Do they have more or significantly more or less Medicaid patients or private pay patients than other nursing homes? Yeah, you know, I am um, trying to remember off the top of my head. I, I so in the nursing home universe, the way that um, patients and kind of like lucrativeness of patients, if you will, tends to be discussed is more around whether it's a Medicare patient or a Medicaid patient. So these are the two different ways that um, the federal government in the United States provides some level of health insurance um, for seniors in particular. And so in nursing homes, um, it, it, you're largely dealing with a population that is either seniors or people who have um, long-term disabilities, which, which often qualify for Medicaid. Medicare is the federal government's program for seniors. It will typically cover nursing home care after a hospital stay or in a more acute illness and it reimburses at a much higher level than Medicaid, which is the state level program that is you know, more for long-term care. But often patients can go back and forth between the two, depending on what's going on. And as I recall, the Trilogy nursing homes um, were, were uh, better than many on the um, Medicare reimbursement. So the, the, more, um, the more robust reimbursement um, and, um, and Medicaid, the state level reimbursement uh, is, is the lower reimbursement um, that, you know, some nursing homes uh, have more of. Thank you. And I, I want to thank you, Leticia, for this excellent conversation. And I want to thank our audience for all of their great questions today. We'll be sending you a survey shortly, asking for your feedback on today's program and for your ideas and other topics that would be of interest to you. So please take a moment to complete it. We also urge you to help support these webinars, and you can find more information here on how to do this. We'll be archiving this webinar a little later today at centerforhealthjournalism.org. Thank you so much for joining us.